Here we go. Uh, I, I have a message for you today, and it's framed around the timing of God. But, but, but there's a, a, a subject to this, and if, if you wanted to sort of add that to this theme or this message title, it's uh, uh, a birth of a vision or an expectation, a death of that vision or expectation, and then the resurrection of that vision and expectation. It's the time of God. It says in Genesis 1.14, during the, 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 the week of creation, that, that God placed the sun and the moon and the stars in the sky, the signs, seasons, days and years. And, and if you think about the universe, if you think about the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets and, and all of these cosmic uh, components, they interact According to the laws of physics, beyond all of our understanding, like a huge giant cosmic clock. The moon orbits the earth, the earth orbits the sun. The sun in its orbit trajectory revolves around the Milky Way, our home galaxy. And there's probably an extension of that and an extension of that, cosmically speaking. If you consider and can uh, sort of uh, grasp the almost infinite, perhaps definitely infinite scale of the physical universe. But coming back to that scripture, signs and seasons and days and years, the word signs is actually the Hebrew word moe. I'm sure Peter can uh, confirm that or correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Moe, and, and it literally means a, prof, a prophetic foretelling of events yet to happen. Mm -hmm. And there's an aspect to this which is uh, central to the timing of God. And God's timing so often is far different to ours. It says in Isaiah 55 that uh, his thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways, and you could probably add to that. His sense of timing is not our sense of timing. And if you picture a little child, one year old or two years old, their concept of dinner time is now. Not when the clock ticks over to 6 p.m. or whatever. <coughs> and, and we, when it comes to uh, the things of God, see them through our own filter. Mm. Now. You've heard the one, God give me patience, but give it to me now. <laughs> and and, and um, there's this whole issue of time. And, and so I'm, I'm going to come back to this as I sort of unfold my message this morning, but, uh, this afternoon. But um, uh, you've been covering a, a study through the book of Ephesians. And one of the, the, the prime uh, areas of focus within that book is, the, is the, the ministry offices of apostle and prophet. As you know, in Ephesians 2.20 it talks about how um, uh, the church is built on the foundation of apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself, so the, the, the head of the corner, the chief cornerstone and all of that. And this, this flow through the book of Ephesians, and indeed through the whole New Testament, uh, looks at the, uh, the influence and the relationship of apostles and prophets working together. And that comes out again in Ephesians 4.11 that the Apostle Susie uh, touched on last week, was uh, that the fivefold ministry, which is there for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry, until we all come into that place of maturity and all of that, looks at apostles and prophets. Apostles and prophets as, uh, as uh, not preeminent, but they are listed first in that grouping of, of gifts. And um, just, just for your interest, um, uh, according to Strong's in the New Testament, 
the word for pastor or pastors is referenced only once, and that's actually in Ephesians 4.11. Apostles are mentioned 83 times in the New Testament. Prophets are 162 times. Now this is, this is, uh, this is King James Strong's references. And there may be other words that can be interchanged and uh, uh, superimposed, such as elder or bishop or whatever. But, 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 but that, that, that's not as important as this. The New Testament church, the church in the book of Acts, was built upon the ministry foundations of apostles and prophets. And, and in the book of Acts, the two main Christian centres that emerged were the, the church at Jerusalem, which was very much temple focused, feasts of the Lord focused, and it was sort of quite inward looking. But Paul and Barnabas, they, they started to operate in the area of apostolic missions out of Antioch. And Antioch, different to Jerusalem, Antioch was a ascending church, a church that had a, a, a reach out to Gentiles a church that uh, uh, was the complement and the supplement of the church at Jerusalem. And these were the two main centres of Christian uh, expression and culture back in those days of the book of Acts. But you, you, you find by the 3rd century, 4th century, that the main centres of Christianity in the world were no longer Jerusalem. Jerusalem was sacked by the Romans in 70 AD. And the importance of Antioch diminished compared to the growth of the church in Byzantium, which became Constantinople, which became Istanbul, and so on. And the other main centre of Christianity was, was Rome. And so these, these two became the, the, the political and religious powerhouses of the, of the church that was growing into Europe, into Asia, and down into Africa. And, and the thing is, the, the arose what, what certain ones considered to be the need to standardise doctrine and faith. And so they had this council in 325 AD in Nicaea, in Turkey. And, and the thing about that was, uh, it was one of a number of councils that took place over the next 500 years, 400 years. And one of the things that was instituted in the council at Nicaea was uh, a severance. This is Pino's territory. There was a severance between Ju Judaism and the New Testament Christian Church, and a distancing, and uh, the emergence of what's termed replacement theology. That our, our, our Jewish roots were no longer relevant. The, the Christian Church was, was a different entity, and to our great discredit, that has been very much the case that's uh, been outworked over the last uh, 1,500 years or more. Now, what happened also in the Council of Nicaea uh, and other councils, they, they replaced Passover with Easter, overlaying a pagan uh, ceremony or uh, celebration. Uh, Christmas <coughs> emerged, which was also a corruption, and, and, and other things took place. But if we go back to that word moed, it refers to the feasts of the Lord that God gave all peoples, not just the Jews. They're not the feasts of the Jews. They are the feasts for all of us to observe and to uh, engage in, in faith. And I, I could go down a whole rabbit hole there, but I'm not because I want to actually hold it back into uh, this area that, that, that brings the focus on the apostles and the prophets. But just briefly, from Nicaea, through the next 500 years, the fivefold ministry was lost to the church. 
and the first ministry office to, 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 to be lost was the office of apostle, followed by prophet, followed by evangelist, followed by teacher, followed by pastor. And that's in the exact order that they're listed in Ephesians 4.11. And so by 800 AD, with these offices lost, and the church operating with a clergy laity model of, of control and of, of sort of political uh, uh, modelling, we entered the Dark Ages. And there were little uh, monasteries here and there, but really the, the advance of the Great Commission uh, stumbled, stalled, and all of that. And it wasn't until the Renaissance took place and that began in the 1300s, 1400s with science and art and music and literature, philosophy, and the Great Reformation. And, and with it, we saw the restoration of the fivefold ministry over the next 500 years uh, up until sort of the days we live in now. And that restoration has taken place over the years, over the centuries, with first of all the restoration of the, of the, the ministry office of the pastor, and then teaching, and then evangelism, and with evangelism you had the great evangelistic movements that mm. took place in the 1700s and 1800s with William uh, Carey and Hudson Taylor, and, and later on with what's his name, that American one, Finney. And, and, and so on and so forth. And that, that's built even into the 20th century with great ones like D.L. Moody and uh, Billy Graham and, and other ministries. And, and, and so we come into the 20th century and we see the restoration of the office of the prophetic. And in these days now we are seeing more and more the re-establishment and the recognition of it, the office of apostle and the very powerful dynamic that, 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 that works itself in the realm of the spirit with apostles and prophets working together. And that's been very much something I know has been on Susie Tony's heart, other churches, other ministries. It's very, very topical. And there's a prophetic word that was released this last week, uh, or a couple of weeks ago, by Veronica West. And I'm going to read that to you. Because although it was released in Ireland, I think it was, it is relevant to who we are, mm -hmm. sons and daughters of the Most High God, here in the south lands of the Holy Spirit. And that was some mention that before in prayer or whatever. So this is the prophetic <coughs> word. And in speaking it, I'm not only quoting the prophetic word, I'm actually re-releasing it into the realm of the spirit that it will have an impact, an effect, and ultimately a harvest. So this is the prophetic word, okay? Mm -hmm. Veronica West. God is raising up apostolic and prophetic houses and war room round tables for the days ahead. <coughs> she says. So today I heard the Spirit say it's time to build apostolic and prophetic houses and establish war room round tables for the days ahead. I see God reforming, restructuring and transforming nations <coughs> through apostolic and prophetic houses, say like this one here, and war room round tables. These houses and war room round tables will understand the transforming power of prayer and recognize that nothing can be accomplished without it. I believe that historic and prophetic houses and war room round tables will play a more crucial <coughs> role in the days ahead. These houses and war room round tables will be established under the guidance of humble apostles and pure prophets who are anointed and appointed by God to lead and direct his people in this critical hour on earth. 
We are living in a critical hour. Decisions are being made, events are taking place in which history is pivoting on the edge, one way or the other. It says they, referencing these apostles and prophets, will truly understand the importance of prayer and prophetic intercession. And they will, they will be equipped with the spiritual gifts and end time apostolic and prophetic mantles necessary to see mighty breakthroughs and extraordinary miracles happen. Through God fearing and Christ like leadership, they will usher in a supernatural transformation in the spiritual realm which will manifest powerfully in the natural. By building and establishing war rooms and coming together as war room round tables, the remnant will be rightly aligned and positioned with the heart of God, where they will receive divine revelation and strategy for their nations. I see that these strategic gatherings of prophetic intercessors, prophets and apostles is essential for breaking through spiritual strongholds over territories and releasing God's power and authority over the nations. I submit, she says, one of the main objectives of a war room round table can be found in Daniel 2, 22, where God reveals deep and mysterious things and knows what lies hidden in darkness. Similarly, Jeremiah 33, 3 reminds us to call upon the Lord and he will answer us by revealing marvelous <coughs> and wondrous things that we could never figure out on our own. The Ecclesia had been given all the authority to govern and legislate, and we have been given the responsibility to wage war for the destiny of the nations and to decree life and declare victory into our nations. So, she says, in this time of radical shifts and greater shakings, we must continue to seek God's face and press into his presence and we will see the fulfilment of his promises and the manifestation of his kingdom government established on the earth. So let us not grow weary in doing good, but let us continue to stand strong in faith and unity, knowing that God is actively working through us, his rising, shining remnant to reform, restructure, and transform nations for his glory. Yes, come on. Let's heed the clarion call to come together in prayer and seek God's guidance in all that we do. It's time to be intentional in our pursuit of God's will and purpose being established in our nations. Together, we can be agents of change. I just love it uh, on um, uh, the over, uh, 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 open Heavens Ministry that speaks of uh, Suzette as an apostle slash agent of change. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you know that. Together we can be agents of change for kingdom transformation and become instrumental in bringing about a revival and restoration that will impact generations to come. Mm -hmm. Great prophetic word. Great prophetic word. Okay. <coughs> I'll just put that aside for now. <coughs> so, the 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 fivefold ministry giftings were given to the church at the time that Jesus ascended to go to heaven. It was at that same time that, that, that Jesus also released the Great Commission. 
And the Great Commission itself is an, is an example of the, uh, the apostolic and the prophetic. In, in fact, you can think of um, uh, Hitcher, a, a DNA molecule, the double helix. And you've got two strands, and it's like one strand you can picture as being apostolic, and the other strand that uh, spirally interweaves with it. I know you medical professionals know all about that sort of stuff. Uh, and, and, and they are linked to each other. And it's through that linking that the, the, the synergy of those two offices uh, is, is uh, empowered. And, and the word of uh, power, I'm going to dwell on that for a minute because uh, in the group there are two primary words for power. Uh, one is exousia, which is power, which means delegated authority. The sort of power that a policeman has or a judge has. And then there's dynamis power, and that's uh, um, like the spring box. Physically <laughs> overpowering a bite. We won't talk about Australia. Bad days for the insects. So, so, um, so, uh, power, it says here, power demands have uh, alignments with different versions, well, not different versions different recordings of the Great Commission. And so if you go to Matthew 28, verses 27 to 28, hmm. so Jesus releases the Great Commission in Matthew 28. And he says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All power, all exousia power, all executive power that I am uh, 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 um, authorised to delegate to you. That's the word exousia. And he says this. And it's very apostolic. Uh, I could ask you, but I don't have to. I'll be telling you. <laughs> yes. Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's the Great Commission. But it's, it's in framed in an apostolic sort of uh, emphasis. And then you go to Mark 16. But it's still the same Great Commission. But there's a different emphasis on it. Mark 16, verse 15. He said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who, has been, he who has believed and has been baptised shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And then he talks about signs, he talks about the miraculous, he talks about the dynamis aspects of uh, outworking the Great Commission. He says, These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. And there you have those two references in Matthew and Mark, the apostolic and the prophetic uh, emphasis in the Great Commission, working side by side. And so if you then go to the book of Acts, Chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, from verse 7. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own power, authority, exousia. This is again an aspect of God's timing, the, the, the great heavenly clock 
that's operating not to our expectations and our convenience and, 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 and our uh, self-conceived needs and wants. This is a God thing. That's in his time and he says. And he, and he says, uh, I've done this by my own authority, exousia. And he says, but you will receive power. So there's only four words apart for the two powers, but one is exousia, the other is dunamis. There it is. You shall receive dunamis power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall, you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the uttermost part of the earth. This is the Great Commission again. It's the Great Commission. And, and so the book of Acts then unfolds in a way that talks about the, the growth of the early New Testament church. Numbers being added to daily. Multiplication exponential growth, and so forth. And the boldness displayed by ones like Peter and John. So, time of God. And with uh, expectations, they can rise, and they can fall and just come crashing like a pile onto the floor. And when there's no hope, and all seems lost, and I'm going down to the garden to eat worms, and, and, and everything's just horrible, 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 and all that, uh, God can come and bring resurrection to vision and hope and expectation. And so I'm going to tell you a, a story about a girl, true story. When we were pastoring, when we were pastoring back in New Zealand, this would be about 20 years ago, uh, there was this uh, uh, lovely, very sweet spirited girl, uh, really gorgeous spirit, and um, uh, new Christian, just full of the excitement of uh, serving and loving God and all of that. And uh, we had the honour of discipling her and bringing her through into a place where uh, she's just an amazing person. Anyway, uh, at that time we had a connection with the ministry in Tanzania. And this was a, uh, an important and significant ministry that would, that would train up pastors and fivefold leaders and, 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 and release them into church planting. Uh, around the whole region, not just Tanzania, but Uganda, uh, what's now South Sudan, Kenya, uh, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. And, and so this, this, this girl just grabbed this amazing sort of uh, hunger and vision and desire to go to Africa and be a missionary, even if it's just for a few weeks, to just experience and all of that. And, and so she was a university student, and um, uh, she would travel <coughs> over to the other side of Auckland, it's about 45 minutes to an hour. That was back then. Uh, it's probably even longer now. Yeah, it is. So, so we encouraged her to uh, uh, go to evening services in a church over in, on, on that side of the city so that she could have a connection and relationship with a greater range of uh, young people of her own age. And, and, and that was all great, but she was still very much uh, a member of our church. And she saved her little pennies somehow uh, as a university student and was excited about going to Africa. And, um, and that for her was the birth of a vision, the birth of an expectation, just something that she just uh, uh, just sparkled with us in terms of uh, <coughs> ministry adventure and all of that. And, and then one day she turns up at our doorstep, uh, heartbroken, absolute, an absolute mess, <coughs> inconsolable, because she had invested so much into this, uh, this, this um, event. Spiritually speaking, it's like her whole 
heart and soul had been sewn into them. And, and she was told that she couldn't go. Because this was a missions uh, <coughs> initiative by the other church that we had a relationship with. And oh, it broke our hearts too. It's just, oh, what, what can we do with this? Uh, for her, the vision, the expectation of the Jews had been killed. <coughs> all of that. And, and so, uh, cup of tea or whatever it was, um, we just have to get us we'll see what we can do. And, and um, so she and I went over to meet with the, the ministers of this other church and, and uh, we were able to uh, have a memorandum of understanding that uh, she would come under their covering for the purposes of the trip. And so we had, to, we had this sort of uh, arrangement put in place and so she was able to go. <coughs> And, um, and she had the time of her life. She climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> we, uh, we, we, we hooked up a live feed for the church on Sunday morning and, and were able to communicate both ways. Uh, amazing technology, amazing innovation, I should say, to make it work. And, and, the, uh, and, and so, birth of a vision, death of a vision, resurrection of a vision. But there was an aspect of it that was all in the time of God. Mm -hmm. and, and we just don't see things the way God sees things. His ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts, and all of that. So, uh, she, she came back and she ended up marrying the son of the directors of the mission over in uh, Tanzania. And, um, Oh, very sweet. We've got three gorgeous kids in our lives. And, and so, uh, all things work for good to those who love the Lord, who are called according to His purposes. Right. Okay. So, so that's that's a that's a happy story. Um, now, I, I want to come back to scripture here. You see, uh, Jesus in his three and a half years of ministry would go to Jerusalem from time to time, usually coinciding with the feasts there. He would reveal himself to be the Messiah by identifying with the bread of life, by identifying with the, the, the fountain of living waters, the, uh, the, the Passover lamb, all, all of these things. So I might go deep into that. And, and he'd perform these miracles. And of course, word would get out and spread around about this prophet teacher from Nazareth, of all places. And, uh, and people with needs for miracles would have their faith and expectations lifted. And, and, and there would be the blind man in the, the pool. And, and, There'll be other examples of these amazing miracles of healing, of, of uh, casting out demons uh, into pork, into, <laughs> and, and, and into all sorts of things in places, you know. And, 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 and so there was, this, there was this one man, and, and he was a uh, lame from birth. And, and he had this hot location. At the, the gate's beautiful. Now, uh, I think, were you talking about the door, the gates? Oh, that's in the Okay, look, uh, in, in, in the Greek there's a, a word for, for door, and it's the same as portal, and it's the same as gate. And it's a very easy word to remember. I want you to say, through you. Through run. And it's, it's easy to remember. You know, when you come to a door or, or, or a gate or uh, um, a portal, you go through run. The door or the gate or the portal. So, 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 so you can remember that. Uh, uh, what's a portal for? For going through run. You know, so, so, um, so he would be positioned at the gate beautiful. 
And it was a really important location because people would be coming and going to and from the temple. <coughs> Perhaps with the thought of arms for the, the needy mm -hmm. and, and all of that. And, and, and everyone would have known this guy. Yeah. And, and he probably traded in news. He, he could have even been, um, this is just what I imagine, he could have been like a town crier, uh, uh, a news broker. Mm -hmm. uh, like, what's the latest, Barry? Well, did you hear me? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and, and, and all of that. And so he accepted his fate. He accepted his lot in life. He was born lame. He was going to die lame. He had to make the best out of life. And that was being a person of importance by location. Location, location, location. Okay, yes. <laughs> Look at the beautiful gates. Oh, it's just the place for you. Yes. <laughs> now, uh, he began to hear these stories of this teacher prophet who was working in the area of miracles, like the prophets of old, like Elijah, like Moses, like um, um, whoever operated in the miraculous back then, Elisha, and, and so forth. And, and uh, he eventually saw Jesus come, pass him by, into the temple. And, and, and his expectations would rise and, and oh, oh, I have an expectation that's, that's just, look, I, I hear that, you know, uh, if someone touches the hem of his garment, stuff happens. Yeah. All, all sorts of things, this, this mystic, this incredible mural making uh, uh, prophet teacher. And and so Jesus comes, Jesus goes, it's not just two, maybe next time. Next time comes, Jesus comes, Jesus goes, but not him. Others were being blessed. Ever thought and, or felt that why, why are other people getting blessed and I'm being overlooked? Had that feeling? <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but here he, here he is, you see. And, um, and, and, and one day, at the time of Passover, and every time Jesus passes, he seems to just pass over, but um, uh, one day, he hears that this only hope that he has has been arrested. And it's going to be crucified. And, 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 and of course, Jesus is. And his hopes that have been risen up like this, because he'd seen him with his own eyes. Gone. Shattered. Smashed. <laughs> and he accepts his lot. Okay, that wasn't my time. That wasn't meant for me. That wasn't the right time. So I'm just going to go back to my spot. Trade news smile at people that they might have sympathy, sympathy on me. Maybe give me a few coins to get me through for the next day. And so on. So, Jesus is crucified. There are rumours that he's risen again, but this guy's given up all hope. He's, he's, that's his spot. That's his life. This is your life. You know, and all of that. And, and, and then one day, a couple, a couple, a couple will pass, but they, oh, they, they were the ones that used to hang out with this prophet teacher, and 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 they're walking along towards the gates, and there's something about them. They're, they're crackling, and there's sort of uh, sparks flying off them, and there's, you know, uh, 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 they're trying to fight the way through the angels and, and, and all of that. And and and, 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 and oh, this poor guy, this poor guy, he's got no elevated sense of spiritual hope or expectation. He, he just puts his um, hand out and Peter 
and John look at him. And they're thinking, oh, I've got their attention. I wonder how much it'll be. You know? And Peter and John go up to him and say, gold and silver we don't have. But what we, what we do have is this. <laughs> death of a vision, resurrection of a vision, in the time of God. And so, this is a real problem for the scribes and Pharisees. Because it was just 50 days earlier, they thought they'd got rid of that troublemaker. But that, that guy who turned up and ruined their Passover, their feast of unleavened bread, their feast of was supposed to be about them. And, and that guy ruined it 50 days ago. But we got rid of him. Now we can enjoy our Pentecost without any problems. With, with all of the... We, we made it all go away. And just when the scribes and the Pharisees and the political leaders thought that they had kept the whole thing and, and seen off this imposter of a prophet who claimed to be Messiah of all things. It's got rid of them. Now we can enjoy our feasts with me again. Hold the places of honour in the high tables so that the people will look upon us and say, Oh, hallowed, hallowed priests, hallowed scribes and Pharisees. Oh, and they'll be up there going, Oh, look at my phylactery, look at my phylactery. <laughs> my robes and all of that. And, and, and so, it's, it's not long after that, when they think they've got rid of this whole sort of uh, Jesus thing, Peter and John come and kick the hornet's nest. And <coughs> it's all on again. It's all on again, and this time there's just no holding back. Yeah. So that's in. I did it without having to read anything. So I'm not going to repeat it. So it's Acts chapter 3, verses. Okay, the whole chapter, because of chapter 3. The first part is that story of, of the, the, you see, he's immortalised in scripture. Mm -hmm. yeah, he sure is. Everyone story. knows his story. Yeah. Yeah. Down through the millennium. Right. It wasn't his time until it was God's time. Yes. Yeah. God's time. So good. And, and so, uh, don't be heavy-hearted or downcast when things don't happen according to your timetable. All things work to good to those who are called according yes. to his purposes. And so there's this that's required. Trust. Yes. <coughs> Faith and trust. Mm -hmm. How time? Okay, that's, that's, that's quite good. I really haven't got a lot more to say on, on this subject, uh, except we've been crying out for revival. We've been crying out for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in this land, in this region. And, and why hasn't it been? And every year passes, or every election cycle passes, and, and we seem to be further away from God and closer to hell because of legislation, because of the, the corrupt and black hearts of our politicians, because of the corrupt press, and the, the grip that the demonic and the satanic has on us. But I'm going to tell you this, for the times they are changing. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 3 talks about there is a time and a season yes. 
turn, turn, turn. <laughs> and time for every purpose under heaven. We are approaching that time. We stand on the promises of God and the words of the prophets that have been spoken. Words like the erotical nest. Words like uh, uh, Smith Wigglesworth. Cindy Jacob. Patricia King. Other great prophets and revelators in the other land here, or from New Zealand, or from the other nations. God is looking to position us to be vessels worthy and to honour for such a time as this. Yes. Our need needs to be one where we put faith and trust in God to fulfil the words that have been spoken. Yes. Because there will be the fulfilment of the Great Commission. Every ethnic people group, tongue and nation will receive the gospel before the end. And that's in Matthew 24, 14. And there are two aspects to that word end. We think, we think of it in terms of end of the age, yes, but it also means end, complete fulfilment of the Great Commission mandate, job done. Yes. 